Have you ever wondered if your life pleased God? And if you didn't, what exactly does He want you to do to make things right? And where exactly do we stand in history to know what difficulties would face us and how to overcome them? History repeats itself and those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was unhungered? Matthew 12, 3 Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Matthew 12, 5 Reading the Bible, which claims to be the Word of God, and studying history will show you where man has fallen or how they succeeded. Therefore, I encourage you to join me in this study as we go through the post-Christian history and what the Word of God says to us concerning that time period. Typology in a Christian theology and biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Events, persons, or statements in the Old Testament are seen as types prefiguring or superseded by antitypes. Events or aspects of Christ or His revelation described in the New Testament. For example, Jonah may be seen as the type of Christ in that he has emerged from the fish's belly and thus appeared to rise from death. In the fullest version of the theory of typology, the whole purpose of the Old Testament is viewed as merely the provision of types for Christ, the anti-type or fulfillment. Typology, etymology. The term is derived from the Greek noun typos, a blow, hitting, stamp, and thus the figure or impression made on a coin by such action. That is, an image, figure, or statue of a man. Also, an original pattern, model, or mold. To this is prefixed the Greek preposition anti, meaning opposite, corresponding. Istanbul, once known as Constantinople, the continual city with the walls of Theodosius that lasted from the 5th to the 15th century. It lasted a thousand years. Whatever happened to the city that Constantine the Great settled as he moved from Rome to be closer to Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor and the Middle East? Throughout the medieval period, it was considered to be the center of Christian scholarship and learning. The Patriarchate of Constantinople continued, whereas the School of Antioch, Syria, Jerusalem, and the School of Alexandria, Egypt, eventually passed on to Islamic rule. Now let us go back in time to the dawn of the 7th century and also see what the prophetic word of God, the Bible, said concerning that period. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. Judges 2.6, the 7th book of the Bible. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Judges 3.1 
only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Judges 3 2. In 602, Maurice, with the lack of money as always dictating policy, decreed that the army should stay for winter beyond the Danube. The exhausted troops mutinied against the emperor. Probably been judging the situation, Maurice repeatedly ordered his troops to start a new offensive rather than return to winter quarters. His troops gained the impression that Maurice no longer understood the military situation and proclaimed Focus their leader. They demanded that Maurice abdicate and proclaim as successor either his son Theodosius or General Germanus. Both men were accused of treason, but riots broke out in Constantinople and the emperor left the city with his family for Nicomedia. Theodosius headed east to Persia, but historians are not sure whether he had been sent there by his father or if he fled there. Phocas entered Constantinople in November and was crowned emperor, while his troops captured Maurice and his family. Maurice was murdered on the 27th of November, 602, some sources say 23rd of November. The deposed emperor was forced to watch his six sons executed before he was beheaded himself. Empress Constantina and her three daughters were spared and sent to a monastery. The Persian king Khosrow II used this coup and the murder of his patron as an excuse for a renewed war against the empire. And thus ended the Justinian dynasty as the 6th century came to a close. Just as Joshua conquered Canaan, but not entirely, Emperor Justinian I from the Justinian dynasty reconquered the Mediterranean, and that era ended. Allow me to bring you to your attention that earlier, when I quoted the Emperor Maurice of the Byzantine Empire at the closing of the 6th century, I quoted from the 7th book of the Bible, Judges. You will notice in God Willing My Future videos as well that each century seems to be opening a new book from the Bible or a set of books. Whereas the 6th century, without going through the details at this moment, was represented by Joshua, the sixth book of the first cycle, Hosea, the sixth book of the second cycle, also the sixth prophetic book from Isaiah, and Philippians, the sixth book of the third cycle, also the sixth epistle. The seventh century will be focusing on the seventh book, Judges, as well as the seventh of the second cycle, Joel, and the seventh epistle, Colossians. This is how the Bible wheel is thematically linked throughout history. The 7th century is reserved for the Heraclean dynasty. The name Heraclius means a hero. And weren't the judges considered to be heroes? As the Spirit of God would come down upon them and they would do some mighty deeds to save the children of Israel after they cried out to God because of their oppression by their foreign powers? Heraclius was named after the mythical Hercules, and he was the son of another Heraclius, the Exarch of Carthage. And how exactly does the 7th century start? It starts with the murder of Emperor Maurice by the general Phocas. He ascends to the throne and abuses his power by breaking the seventh commandment. He rapes a nobleman's wife. Who would imagine someone coming from far away, a distant land in Africa? Carthage, after cutting off Egypt's corn supply to Constantinople, 
to catch up the oppressing emperor as he and take over his kingdom. He made contact with the prominent leaders and planned an attack to overthrow aristocrats in the city and soon arranged the ceremony where he was crowned and acclaimed as emperor. When he reached the capital, the excubitors, an elite imperial guard unit led by Focus's son-in-law Briscus, deserted to Heraclius, and he entered the city without serious resistance. When Heraclius captured Focus, he asked him, Is this how you have ruled, wretch? Focus's reply, And you will rule better? So enraged Heraclius that he beheaded Focus on the spot. He later had the genitalia removed from the body because Focus had raped the wife of Photius, a powerful politician in the city. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Romans 7 5. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans 7 6. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.24 I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of the Lord, but with the flesh the law of sin. Romans 7.25 O wretched man that I am! This is the main theme of the seventh century. While man at first may be a hero, in the end he is wretched. The motion or cycle of sin in Judges is as follows. Israel serves the Lord, falls into sin, is enslaved, cries out to the Lord, God raises up a judge, Israel is delivered, and Israel again serves the Lord. And so Romans 7 applies to the 7th century Rome, the Eastern Roman Empire, later known as the Byzantine Empire. Allow me to show you what things are in common between the 7th century's Heraclius' period and on the 7th spoke, as the spoke of a wheel, Judges, Joel, and Colossians. In the book of Joshua, Joshua was victorious throughout the book except chapter 7. Why? because Achan had kept the accursed thing as spoil, which was supposed to be destroyed. As a result, the children of Israel lost their battle. But in the book of Judges, following the death of Joshua and the elders who fought alongside with him, the children of Israel were overcome by their enemies by the will of God because they forgot him. And this is what happened in the seventh century as well. Phocas became abusive in his reign, which led to the excuse of the Persian king Khosrow to break his alliance and the won Shah many battles against with a huge him. Force, and he started defeating Phocas in, in one battle after another, taking over different parts of the empire. Uh, and this led eventually between the corruption, the brutality of Phocas, and the losses of the empire to Khosrau led to a revolt against Phocas. And in 608, uh, the Exarch of Carthage, which is an area in North Africa, it was, that was a whole uh, rich, at that time prosperous area, uh, led his army, including many of the native people who were uh, called the Berbers and other names at that time. Now they would be called Arabs, but that is because the Arabs invaded that area within a few years after Heraclius and, and really settled in and imprinted their culture on that area. Uh, so he sent the fleet under his son, Heraclius. Both of them were Heraclius. Heraclius the father, Heraclius the son, sent his fleet uh, towards Constantinople to revolt against Phocas. 
and that was uh, in 608. And there was uh, two years of fighting that followed. And in 610, Fakas was captured, and he was personally, according to historians, personally executed by uh, Heraclius. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold a young lion roared against him. Judges 14.5 And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father or his mother Heraclius what he had was, done. Uh, Judges 14.6 action, a uh, very strong, uh, large person and in fact in Carthage in North Africa he had a reputation of going into uh, the gladiator arena and personally fighting lions and uh, killing lions with his sword and other uh, military equipment. So he, he executed Focas and established his rule in 610 AD. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Joel 3, 9. 7th book, 2nd cycle. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Joel 3, 10. 7th book, 2nd cycle. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. Heraclius At the least, such as before knew the nothing thereof. Training Judges the military. Three, two. military was devastated. And in fact, uh, the military from uh, the area that Focas got his support from was almost non existent. So he had to rebuild the military totally. So he started training large numbers of troops. And. Uh, preparing them for battle. And he was faced at the beginning with major challenges. Uh, and the challenges at the beginning were uh, two huge military challenges. One was Kasrau kept invading. Kasrau kept asking uh, that Theodosius be uh, recognized as uh, the legitimate emperor of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire and naturally Heraclius wouldn't accept that and so Kostrao kept taking over more and more territory. So uh, he had to rebuild the military to face the Persian threat and the Persians were very powerful at that time. Uh, they were the most powerful nation in the Middle East in the early uh, 7th century and Kostrao was a strong leader, a strong king. So he was coming towards Constantinople. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. And the Judges 2, 14, 7, book, first cycle. With the Avars and with some of the Slavs to attack Constantinople. So uh, the main thing that uh, Heraclius concentrated on at first was to build up the military, recruit people in the military, pay them properly, get money uh, for the military, and also to repair the walls of Constantinople, which had been uh, run down uh, significantly. So he built new sections of the walls and uh, new sections to make the walls strong and be able to repel an attack. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance uh, to possess the after land. After rebuilding Judges the army, 2, 6, seventh uh, book, Heraclius first cycle. decided to go on the offensive against the Persians. Now, uh, he rebuilt the army in a way that was revolutionary up to that time, uh, probably based on advice that he received, uh, he decided to give 
every soldier lands in parts of the Eastern Roman Empire and it divided up much of the Eastern Roman Empire into districts called teams, thema. Uh, and there, every theme would have uh, land given to every soldier and uh, their uh, descendants, their sons, would be expected to also be soldiers. So this would be uh, a way in which every soldier would have a stake, personal stake, in defending his own land because it's their, his land, their family's land. And the whole area was governed by uh, like a military governor called Estatigius. And that worked out amazingly well, uh, actually. And many historians believe that this was the key to the survival of the Eastern Roman Empire against all the threats that came uh, from many different kinds uh, and then different areas, especially later the Arab threat, which we mentioned later. Uh, because the soldiers were really, uh, you know, different than the previous. He built a whole new army uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. Previously, it was an army which fought for pay. And that included uh, not only Greeks and uh, Slavs and others, but anybody who'd be willing to fight for pay. And uh, that wasn't enough of a motivation, especially if the money wasn't there. Yeah, they were mercenaries for the most part. So by giving them land, that became a supreme motivation. And especially in the area of Anatolia, which is today Turkey, uh, mu much of Anatolia was divided up into uh, teams and uh, land given to soldiers. So he built a whole new army on a new model. And the, the army at first uh, was not very successful. Uh, and Heraclius, when he took over the empire, had no military experience at all. Uh, so at first, uh, we have uh, the continual success of the Persians, even after Heraclius took over. So in 613, the Persians took Damascus, the capital of Syria, and they moved on forward. In 614, the Persians took Jerusalem. Uh, the Persians uh, conquered Jerusalem. Uh, they massacred, uh, estimates go from 50 to about 60,000 people, uh, including priests and so on. And they took about 40,000 slaves out. And with them, as, trophy, as a trophy, they took the true cross, the Holy Cross, as part of which had been in Jerusalem. Uh, and they took it to the capital to hold as a trophy to show they conquered over uh, the Christians because part of the Persian motivation was really religious as well. Uh, the Persians at that time uh, looked down on Christianity. They were Zoroastrian uh, and uh, their belief in many ways was very different and they tried to eliminate or cut back on Christianity. And that, that was uh, a huge blow to the Eastern Roman Empire and the Christian world in general. That was the, that was the beginning of Muhammad's career, 622, and that's considered the year one of the Islamic calendar, the beginning of the Islamic calendar. That was the same year that Heraclius really started on his path of conquest against the Persian, the path that led to the defeat of the Persians. In the year 630 AD, uh, Muhammad returned to Mecca and conquered Mecca. That was the same year that Heraclius came to Jerusalem and took over Jerusalem from the Persians. Uh, Muhammad, according to the reports of uh, many of his followers, has written in what are called the Hadith or Hadithi, which are the statements that are not in the Quran, but in other religious writings, was keenly aware of Heraclius. And he, uh, according to Islamic traditions, sent letters to Heraclius asking him to become a Muslim. Uh, some Islamic scholars claim that Heraclius actually did become a Muslim, uh, but that is absolutely untrue because Heraclius early on recognized that the tide of Islam was the greatest danger now facing the empire. 
At that time, the Roman, Eastern Roman Empire was the only superpower until the rise of Islam. The rise of Islam uh, was an incredible threat because Islam, even under Muhammad, started invading, invading the Roman Empire, the Middle East, taking over one area after another. Allow me to read you the following. Judges 6. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by the, himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go, every man, unto his place. Judges 7.12 And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, Behold, there was a man that told the dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand God has delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped, and returned unto the host of Israel, and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Family Heraclius was married twice. First to Fabia Eudokia, a daughter of, the, of Rogatos, and then to his niece, Martina. He had two children with Fabia, Eudoxia, Epiphania, and Emperor Constantine III, and at least nine with Martina, most of whom were sickly children. Of Martina's children, at least two were disabled which was seen as a punishment for the illegality of the marriage. Fabius had a paralyzed neck, and Theodosius, who was deaf and uh, mute, married Nike, daughter of Persian general Shar Baraz, or daughter of Niketa's cousin of Heraclius. Two of Heraclius's children would become emperor. Heraclius Constantine, Constantine III, his son from Eudokia for four months, 
in 641. And Mar Martina's son Constantine Heraclius Heraclonus in 638 to 641. Heraclius had at least one illegitimate son, John Atalarichos, who conspired a plot against Heraclius with his cousin, the magister Theodorus, and the Armenian noble David Saharuni. When Heraclius discovered the plot, he had Atalarichos' nose and hands cut off, and he was exiled to Principo, one of the prince's islands. Theodorus had the same treatment but was sent to Godomelite, possibly modern day Gozo Island, with additional instructions to cut off one leg. During the last years of Heraclius's life, it became evident that a struggle was taking place between Heraclius Constantine and Martina, who was trying to, to position her son Heraclonus in line for the throne. When Heraclius died, he devised the empire to both Heraclius Constantine and Heraclonus to rule jointly with Martina as empress. Could incest be the reason that after the victory against Khosro II and the Persians, Heraclius and his men fell victim to the Muslims at the Battle of Yarmouk? And in contrast to Judges 6 and 7 read before, the Byzantine army outnumbered the Muslims, but they lost. Troop Deployment most early accounts place the size of the Muslim forces between 24,000 and 40,000 and the number of Byzantine forces between 100,000 and 400,000. Modern estimates for the sizes of the respective armies vary. The vast, the vast majority of the estimates for the Byzantine army are between 80,000 and 150,000 while other estimates are as low as 15,000 to 20,000. Estimates for the Rashidun army are between 25,000 and 40,000. Original accounts are mostly from Arab sources, generally agreeing that the Byzantine army and their allies outnumbered the Muslim Arabs by a sizable margin. The only early Byzantine source is Theophanes, who wrote a century later. Accounts of the battle vary, some stating it lasted a day, others more than a day. And Heraclius tried to stop them, uh, and the Battle of Yarmouk in 634, a battle which lasted about a month, in actuality, man between the maneuvering of the different armies of the Roman Empire and the Arab armies, uh, the Roman Empire army uh, of Byzantium or Constantinople was totally defeated and most of the soldiers were killed and they fled in panic. Heraclius there lost the main army that he had. Day 2, Phase 2 in the Battle of Yarmouk. Despite stiff resistance, the warriors of Yazid on the left flank finally fell back to their camps and for a moment, Bahan's plan appeared to be succeeding. The center of the Muslim army was pinned down and its flanks had been pushed back. However, neither flank had broken, though their morale was severely damaged. The retreating army was met by the ferocious Arab women in the camps. Led by Hind, the Muslim women dismantled their tents and armed with tent poles charged at their husbands and fellow men singing an improvised song of the Battle of Uhud that then had been directed against the Muslims. O oh, you who turn from a constant woman, who had both beauty and virtue, and leave her to the infidel, the hated and evil infidel, to possess disgrace and ruin. This boiled the blood of the retreating Muslims so much that they returned to the battlefield.
But on the second day and second phase of the battle, like Jael, Eber, the Kenite's wife of the family of Moses' father-in-law, armed themselves with a tent pole instead of a nail to make their men return to battle. They also sang an improvised song like the song of Deborah. Judges 4.15 And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Haroshet of the Gentiles. And all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Howbeit, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him milk and covered him. Judges 4.21 Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to, into the ground. For he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Also notice this contrasting theme. Judges 5.1 Then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Ahinoam on that day, saying, Blessed above women shall Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked her water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Cesera, she smote off his head, and she had pierced and stricken through his temple. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he laid down, and at her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. The mother of Caesarea looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming, and why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped, have they not divided the prey? To every man a damsel or two, to Caesarea a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest forty years. Notice the contrasting link of the Muslim women singing a song armed with tent poles, whereas Deborah mentioning that the women of the Canaanites thought Caesarea and his men would take the daughters of the children of Israel captive as a spoil, each man with a maiden or two. And he was now faced with the constant march of tides of Arabs and other Islamic conquests conquerors and converts who were marching and riding towards Constantinople itself to take Constantinople, to take the rest of the Roman Empire. And their goal was to take over all the world, a known world at that time, which was basically uh, Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, and establish the reign of Islam everywhere everything would be under Islam. Uh, under Islam, there might be some allowances for Christianity as a subject religion, with Christians paying a tax 
to be able to exist as Christians and also be uh, way below the rank of Muslims in uh, their uh, status. We have come to the end of our program. God willing, in the next episode, we will continue exploring the 7th century after the death of Heraclius, the introduction of mutilation of his deformed children through Martina, the peace, to prevent them to rule by their half-brother, the invention of Greek fire and the heroic Justinian II's nose mutilation, exile, and return to power at the turn of the 8th century. Thanks for watching.